Hey friends, sometimes my brain goes in strange directions and so today I thought I'd talk a little bit about the meandering path I took in response to a really foolish tweet by Jordan Peterson. So I promise only a brief mention of Jordan Peterson, then we'll move on to the interesting stuff. So I started out with a totally non-productive annoyance. Jordan Peterson being an ass again with this ridiculous tweet. The man has a real problem. This isn't just bad biology, it's bad logic. You can't conclude anything about human nature in this case from the example of ant behavior. That ants have some instinctual behaviors does not preclude the possibility that behaviors in humans may be socially constructed. And this mythical the West and capitalism are excellent examples of entirely socially constructed ideas. So here's what we should do with everything that dribbles out of Jordan Peterson. But I will say this, his comment did lead me to read the source paper, which seems to be more than he has done, and he got it all wrong. It's a fine piece of work. It's not a paper on evolution, so let's be clear about that. It's about ant behavior. When fire ants are digging narrow tunnels, they don't all mob the tunnel, which would be counterproductive. These are narrow tunnels, only two or three ants wide, and they need to keep scurrying back with loads of dirt. So only a few ants at a time do the actual excavating. It says nothing about productive elites or lazy workers, despite Peterson's attempt to imply otherwise. What they found was a mathematically predictable pattern of behavioral optimization to reduce traffic jams. It has nothing to do with capitalism. It does not justify a belief that many humans are lazy and don't do their share of work. But in a related bit of serendipity, a request to write about another paper came across my desk. My correspondent, apparently someone who worked at a university press department, even suggested a theme. So he wrote, Based on your previous reporting, I thought you'd want to know about a paper that appeared overnight in Proceedings of the Royal Society B., suggesting laziness might be a fruitful strategy for survival of individuals, species, and even communities of species. Except, unfortunately, that's also a misleading interpretation. That's not what the paper is about at all. It talks about how variation in the rate of basal metabolism is correlated with the probability of extinction in various clades of mollusks. And that's actually much more interesting than some hypothetical laziness in mollusk species. It's about macroevolution. So here's the story. They examined fossil mollusks from the Neogene, that is the roughly 20 million year pre period prior to the current Quaternary, and characterized each species by its inferred basal metabolic rate, or BMR. They determined the BMR from basically the species size, which I could argue about, but I'll get to that in a bit. They also characterized each by whether it survived or went extinct at some point in the Neogene. What they found is that a species with a higher metabolic rate were more likely to go extinct. Species with slower metabolism were longer lasting. They do a lot of statistical slicing of the data to try and punch holes in that observation. So, for example, asking if there was a difference in species with a broad range versus ones with a narrow range. But the correlation keeps holding up. On average, species that didn't go extinct, the blue bars, had slower metabolisms on average than species with higher metabolic rates, the orange bars, and that pattern held up no matter how they tried to examine the data. There are a couple of quibbles I'm going to make. First, that press release suggestion. Slow BMR is not the same as laziness. It's an adaptive strategy. Likewise, ants not mobbing a narrow tunnel is also not laziness. It's behavioral optimization. This is a danger with trying to force colloquial understanding of human behavior into different species. Second, the question in my mind about the paper was that it was using animal size as a proxy for BMR. Maybe it's not BMR directly that's responsible, but an effect of larger size. Larger animals tend to have longer generation times and smaller population sizes, which make them more susceptible to extinction. But the authors also considered that. So, quoting from the paper, However, our result does not imply that metabolic rate is the sole driver of extinction. For instance, the difference we observe between BMR of extinct and extant species may reflect variation in a constellation of organismic traits such as developmental rate, time to maturity, lifespan, and population size, with a primary causal factor driving these differences being variation in the rate of energy uptake. Further, there are cases where population or species level factors, or even sheer chance, may be influencing patterns of extinction. The difference in result identified for broadly distributed versus narrowly distributed species also certainly advocates for a level of complexity in explaining extinction 
that extends beyond simple BMR values. Nevertheless, that a difference exists in BMR between extinct and extant species does demonstrate a metabolic component to extinction that was previously putative. So, BMR is being used as a proxy for a whole host of factors that contribute to the likelihood of extinction. Please note, having a high BMR does not make a species less fit in an objective, narrowly focused sense. Humans and elephants have a higher level of energy consumption than an ant or a clam, for instance, and our existence does not defy any principles of natural selection. However, our position high up in the food chain does make us more sensitive to environmental perturbation. Radical changes in the global environment are more likely to knock us off than it is mice, for instance. This observation has led to Niles Eldridge's sloshing bucket metaphor. I will quote him from a paper I'll link to down below. Hence the sloshing bucket. Nothing much happens in terms of discernible morphological evolution until environmental change overturns the ecological apple cart. A little degradation, including the deaths of individuals, will not lead to measurable evolutionary change. A huge amount of devastation, on the other hand, can lead to the extinction of entire major groups, prompting the evolution of other large-scale groups. And on intermediate spatiotemporal scales, where individual species are driven to extinction, but not entire higher taxa, new species evolve, populating the new ecosystems. Van Dam and colleagues have recently shown such turnovers to be virtually the entire basis of rodent evolution as preserved in the fossil record of Spain over the past 22 million years. The greater the magnitude of the environmental event, the greater the change in ecosystems, including the magnitude of diversity loss through extinction. The greater the loss of higher taxa, the more different will be the newly evolved taxa, and thus the nature of the succeeding ecosystems that replace the prior disturbing systems. Thinking of our diagram, it's like water sloshing in a bucket. The size of the sloshes depending on how, how hard the bucket is jolted. Thus, figure four depicts a real life fleshing out of the abstract dual hierarchy structure by inserting actual patterns of the history of life the sloshing bucket. Note, the clip is from a game called Splatoon, which I am not cool enough to have ever played, but which is the first thing to turn up when you Google sloshing bucket. Ah, science, always in second place in popular culture. Where this metaphor is useful is in trying to explain macroevolutionary processes that are not dependent on any kind of competition between genomes. On a day-to-day -day basis, the organisms at the bottom of the bucket aren't less fit than the ones at the top, and they aren't even really in competition with one another. The phrase survival of the fittest does not even apply, nor does the concept of adaptation. You can't be selected for fitness to an unexpected radical change in the environment or for a novel environment that doesn't yet exist anywhere. But in conditions of rapid environmental change, and I repeat, a population can't be progressively adapted to an environment com completely different from the one it's currently living in, and in fact, the course of selection optimizes one to better conform to a specific environment, then all bets are off. And if you're on top of the metaphorical bucket, you're more likely to find yourself sloshed out of existence. And just to remind you, Human beings are very near the top of that bucket, and we're in a period of rapid environmental degradation. We should be very concerned if evolutionary history teaches us anything. Oh, and hey, mentioning Niles Eldridge reminded me, uh, should I talk about punctuated equilibrium in my next video? It's an important concept, but it's grossly mis misunderstood by a great many people, even by professional scientists. Uh, so maybe a quick overview of PE would be useful. Let me know in the comments. I'll talk to you later. Thanks.